Why do so many people love being out in nature? It's just so nice. Why do so many people post pictures of sunsets? Uh, why do so many people, when they're stressed, they're like, I got to get outside and get some fresh air, you know? Like, what, there, there's something at the root of that, right? Well, uh, recently, I was reading uh, about this best-selling book called Blue Mind by uh, Wallace Nichols. It lays out scientific evidence that being close to bodies of water promotes mental health and happiness, being close to water. And then in a recent edition of Yale Environment, I read about new studies which point in one direction. Nature is not only nice to have, but a have to have for physical health and cognitive function. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? And of course, we know that nature isn't just nature. Part of the reason it's so amazing and incredible is because it's God's creation. And this is captured really well by a poet, uh, Robertson Jeffers, who says this, He says, God's signature is the beauty of things. I love that. Say it with me. God's signature is the beauty of things. God's signature is the beauty of things. And that's so true, right? A signature usually is evidence that someone has physically been there. You've been up close with someone. Well, this created beautiful world with nature all around us is the signature that God and his beautiful creative power has been there and is there. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about how the creation, nature, is evidence of the creator. Not only that, but it is evidence of his kindness toward us. And also how it and some other things can be common ground that we share with other people who maybe don't yet know their creator, but who we love to find some common ground to help them a little bit more in that process. Okay, so to do that, we're going to open our Bibles to Acts chapter 19. If you have your Bible, that's great. Uh, If you've got the Westminster Church app and you click on the tile that says Sermon Notes, you can fill that out there. I'm going to be going into more uh, more background and detail. I'll serve some of it here, not all of it, but more of it will be in the Pulse podcast that will be uh, published this morning at 11.30. uh, And I'm reading from the New International Version. And a couple of things we need to keep in mind since uh, the last time we went into the book of Acts is that we've skipped ahead a little bit. So last time we were talking about the stoning of Stephen, challenging, uh, troubling story, but God used it for good. And there at at the scene was this young man named Saul, and he was clearly looking on uh, with approval on the stoning of Stephen. And now a lot has happened. So Saul has now become Paul. So he became a persecutor, was a persecutor of the church, And now he became converted to Jesus. He has has this encounter with Jesus, and he goes from harming the church to to being harmed for it, right? He becomes one of the biggest missionaries and evangelists the world has ever known. And so Paul goes on these missionary journeys. He goes on three of them. And the first one, uh, this is the, the text today is from the first one in chapter 14. And he goes to a town named Lystra. So if you imagine where the Mediterranean Sea is, it's, it's above that, it's north of that in modern-day Turkey. And so he's going there, he's going to these different places, doing these things, sharing the message and mission of Jesus. But he's not by himself, he's with someone called Barnabas. And Barnabas we haven't learned much about, but Barnabas was given a nickname, um, son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means, son of encouragement. So he was an encourager, he wasn't one of those people who always see the negative and is a total downer all the time. He's someone you want to be with you, especially as you're going through different kinds uh, of hardships. And they did go through many different kinds of hardships. So chapter 14, beginning at verse uh, 8. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame, couldn't walk. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him. He saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Okay, so this is the first little section. So Paul, we see, is like Peter in the fact that God is able to work through him these miraculous things, as we saw Peter do back in Acts chapter 3. I also think it's interesting to note that that, that people get physically healed. Like sometimes we can think today that only God cares about our internal uh, spiritual existence, but clearly they are doing powerful things where people's physical realities are being changed as well. God cares about our physical existence as well, and we don't always know why or how or when that he acts, uh, but he can and does. And if you haven't re- listened to it, by the way, last week on, on The Word at Westminster, our new Paul cast, uh, we republished that talk by Will Hahn, talking about his own experience on the mission field and, and miracles that he himself have been a part of. It's amazing. You should go back and listen to it. So, so we're seeing miraculous activity here. Verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. 
Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, who, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Hold on, what in the world is happening in this text? Okay, so this is one, of, and there's always background that helps us understand the richness of what's going on and local cultural background, and this is one of those situations, so let me f- share a few words about this. So they do these miraculous things, and all of a sudden, the locals are like, the gods have come down before us, and they call them Zeus and Hermes. Like, what, what in the world? Well, we're helped in our understanding if we realize that, that uh, according to the poet Ovid in his Metamorphoses, um, there had been this legend in this very town where, where these two people, Zeus and Hermes, had in fact come to their village on a vi- visit. And they came, and they were looking for lodging and looking for shelter. And no one would take them in. Everyone shut their doors to them except one elderly couple who was hospitable, who welcomed them in. And because of that hospitality, they turned their little humble cottage into uh, the temple of Zeus, supposedly, according to the story, including like a golden roof and the whole thing. And then Zeus and Hermes, they destroy all the other homes in the village for not welcoming them in. Okay? Now, So all of a sudden, two people, Paul and Barnabas, come to town, and they do miraculous things. And so what's probably in the back of their minds is, wait a second, the last time two powerful figures came to town, according to the story, legend, departing our our little town of Lystra, they destroyed everyone who wasn't hospitable to them. And so that's probably in their mind. They go over the top. We better sacrifice to them as gods. And Zeus is the, you know, king of the Greek gods, you know, according to, to Greek mythology, Hermes is the chief messenger or the god of oratory, so since Paul is doing most of the talking, they assume that that is him. So that's, that's kind of the background of the scene. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes, which is a sign of lament. They're upset at what is going on and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news. And so all of a sudden he shifts and he's going to preach to them. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without witness or testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from the heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Okay, so a lot is going on here, and so he points, he uses this as a chance to point them to the living God. There's one true living God, not a bunch of, he's trying to convince them of monotheism, and he finds the common ground. The common ground is that we all live in this natural, beautiful world. Now, why doesn't he quote the Old Testament to them? Why doesn't he talk to the promises? Why doesn't he talk about the covenants of the people of Israel? Well, they probably don't know anything about that stuff. You know, from what we can tell, they're not Jews. So he tries to find common ground, something that they would understand. Well, creation, nature. So he says, God made all this thing. This is the one true living God. And it's not me and Barnabas, is what he's saying to them. He points to nature and he says, this is like a witness to this one creator God. So think of the word witness or a testimony. Well, in a trial, a witness, you know, it speaks the truth for the benefit of others. He's saying creation, the natural world is like that. It's pointing to the truth for the benefit of others of this one true and living God. Nature is like that. And God's care for us isn't just random and theoretical. He provides rain for the crop. So he's feeding you. He's physically helping you. You may not know this yet, but this is the God who's providing for you all. And fills your hearts with joy. So this God, Paul says, doesn't care just about you living, but about you living joyfully. So it's a sign of God's kindness. But even still, despite what he had said, you know, they kept sacrificing to them. Then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium, verse 19, uh, came and they won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. So we're going to end the text there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a few things about those last uh, couple of verses. Uh, It mentions Jews, and whenever that happens in a broad sense, I like to say it's not like all Jewish people are being cast in a negative light. It's not happening. Paul himself is a Jewish heritage. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, What we're seeing here is that there are a group of people within Judaism 
who, just like Paul, want to stop the message and mission of Jesus, uh, that group, there, there's a group within you know, the larger community trying to pursue them. So it's good to just highlight that and point that out. And I just think another thing is that the crowd is, is, is so strange. They were just venerating them as gods. And all of a sudden, some people come and, 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 ch- and, and chase them down and, and convince them. And the next thing, they're stoning them. Like, that's a 180 degrees. So you get the sense that the people of Leicester are maybe somewhat fickle. We don't really know. And we know there's some disciples there because they gather around them. And Paul, imagine he's been stoned. This is grown men throwing rocks. So picture the scene, black and blue eyes, blood coming down his face, settling in the dirt. Like, they think he's dead. But he gets up, he goes back. The next day, he continues on to Derbe, which is going to be the furthest point on his missionary journey. Okay, so having looked at all that, I think that, you know, at a text like that, you know, Paul is saying things to the people of Lystra that, that, that he's also saying to us and that we need the reminder yet again. And we're going to highlight three of those things next. And the first is that the fact that there is a creation is evidence that there is a creator. Paul, in seeking out this common ground, he's like, we live in this world. He's made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, which, by the way, is a phrase that we hear a lot in the Old Testament. So Paul is pulling from this great you know, religious heritage that he has. One of the places is Exodus 20, 11, and there's a variety of other places, but he's pulling from this language, and he, and he, he tries to appeal to this common ground. There is this creation. It's evidence that there is a creator, and we just need to know as modern people that this is something that should strengthen and fortify our own faith. And the logic behind this is something that we learned in elementary school science. It's called cause and effect. Something can't come from nothing, right? Something can't come. If something is there, something physical, something had to cause it to happen. So, examples. If a baby is born, it didn't just appear. Something had to cause that to happen nine months previous. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? Okay. If I hear a knock at the door, well, that just didn't appear out of nowhere. Someone had to knock and cause it to happen. And so if we have this physical world that somehow needed a beginning, then something non-physical, non-material with intelligence needed to be there to create it to exist because something can't come from nothing. Right? This is one of the big evidences for the existence of God, if you want to look. And there's different nuances to it. It's called the argument from cosmology, and, and you can look it up. But it's so, so powerful and beautiful and fortifying in our faith. Richard Swinburne is a uh, philosopher and a professor in England. He says, the most general phenomenon that provides evidence for the existence of God is the existence of the physical universe for as long as it has existed. This is something evidently inexplicable by science. Another one, Thomas Shepard, who was a pastor and a writer in the 17th century, he's a Puritan. He says, can we, when we behold the stately theater of heaven and earth, conclude other, but that the finger, arms, and wisdom of God hath been here? I love that. So here's my, my challenge for you this week. It's just, when you go about your week, just as you are outside or walking, or no, just notice creation. Just notice it. Think of it as evidence. Think of it, the beauty. Wow. Just think, Wow. Michelangelo pales in comparison. Think of nature, its beauty as evidence. God's signature is the beauty of things. Actually, I hadn't planned on saying this, but I just thought of this. Um, Claude Cox, who is a, is a congregant here and sometimes leads services and leads the thir- Thursday Bible study. I saw him post a picture last week. He was watching the service uh, out, I think, on his back deck with uh, his laptop watching it. And behind it, you can see, Claude, and I know you're watching now. Maybe you're in the same scenario right now. But behind it was like the trees and flowers and this beautiful garden. There's just something about being outside. Number two, the creation reveals its creator and the kindness of its creator. And the kindness of its creator. So Paul says that God's care for us and his kindness isn't abstract. We live in this world that has been created by the one true living God, And he provides for you. So the rain isn't just happenstance. The crops aren't just random. This is God providing for your material needs. And I think we need to hear that as well today. God is providing for us, and that is evidence of his kindness. The text uses the word kindness. Did you wake up today with the breath of life? Thank you, God. Did you wake up today with air to breathe? Thank you, God. Did you wake up today with food to eat? Thank you, God. 
Did you wake up today with freedom to, to live and to worship? Thank you, God. Did you wake up with water to drink? Thank you, God. Kindness, 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 kindness. Each of us has a list as long as Saskatchewan. But not only that, this kindness is also evidenced in joy in your heart. He says God puts that there, verse 17. Joy in your heart. Think of joy. God cares not only about us living, but living joyfully. Think of that feeling when you sing that song of praise that just brings you to a new level. Thank you, God. Think of getting together with great friends and you know those deep belly laughs where you feel, oh, you know, life is tough, but but life is also good. Thank you, God. Think of that time when you like get together with friends or family and, and just it's it's great, one of those wonderful moments, that feeling you have. Thank you, God. Think of that feeling when you get to help or serve someone in a meaningful way as the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you, God. Think of just remembering the cross. That God in Christ has done the most important thing for us, paying the penalty and price for our sins so we can have eternal forgiveness and and, and harmony and peace with him in this life and the next. Thank you, God. Kindness, 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 kindness. And so this week I invite you as you think about creation and the kindness of God, not only providing for you, but putting joy in your heart. Thank God for something that you have never thought of as a gift until now. And the third, our creator cares for his creatures, including those who don't know him yet, which is why we try to identify common ground. So that's what Paul is doing in this text. He's like, okay, you know, people probably don't know the scriptures. I'm not going to quote from the Old Testament here. I'm going to try to identify common ground and go from there. He goes back to the beginning with creation. And that's maybe something that's good for us too, right? People marvel at the world. This is beautiful. Wow. I wonder how this got here. So maybe that's the common ground for, for you and some people we care about because every one of us has someone we know, maybe a friend, maybe someone in our family, at school, in the workplace. We would love them to come to know the living God, to learn more about Jesus, and we wonder, what's the common ground? Maybe it's creation. Let me offer another couple ideas, and maybe this first one seems weird, but sometimes a common ground can be how crazy we think the world is. Listen to how many conversations you have that have some part of someone saying, isn't stuff crazy? Isn't the world crazy right now? Isn't it nuts out there? How many times, and maybe that's the common ground, and then maybe somehow with a spirit of humility and love, you're able to talk about how, how firmly rooted you feel and how there's actually someone to talk to about it. Maybe another bit of common ground could be um, hope. People need hope. Everyone needs and wants hope. And let me tell you, it's in short supply in a lot of people's lives. Suicide, strain. And so what if somehow, in interacting, someone would be talking, maybe showing humbly somehow, that, that in fact, there's a God who is in control, and there's someone to talk to about all this? And when there's a God who is kind and caring in his nature, who is in control, there is always reason for hope, even in the most darkest of days. Another bit of common ground could be um, a connection or belonging. Sometimes people don't belong. They feel disconnected, especially after a pandemic. And so maybe it's something to the fact that, well, we can actually be a part of the body of Christ that spans imperfect, absolutely, I'm imperfect, you're imperfect, part of this meaningful body of Christ that spans all over the world and seeks to serve others in the name of Jesus. Maybe that point of connection or, or belonging is helpful. Fourth, maybe it's purpose. You would be surprised how many people, they won't tell you this, but struggle with a sense of purpose in their life. What is my purpose? Is there any meaning to all this? And they use language about stuff being random, right? That's, that's quite often where this comes. Stuff is random and all oh, who knows, what about this? Nothing really fundamentally means anything. Again, they might not use those words, but they're struggling with a sense of purpose. Well, what if seeing in you or hearing you somehow lovingly and humbly articulating that there is actually meaning and purpose in the footsteps of the man from Nazareth? Recap, the fact that there is a creation is evidence that there is a creator. Two, the creation reveals its creator and the kindness of its creator. 
And our creator cares for his creatures, including those who don't know him yet, which motivates us to identify common ground. Final image, just picture it with me. There's a dad and a son uh, lying in, in a field of grass at night, looking up at the stars. It's dark. This isn't, this isn't me and, and Ben. It's, it's a story someone else told me. They're just having this great bonding moment, sort of arms behind their heads, looking up into the starry sky. They're far outside enough the city that, that you know, that they can see the stars. They're beautiful. And there's a bit of wind blowing behind them, and so there's the sound of that rustling through the grass. And they're just standing there and looking up there, and the boy says, Dad, do you think God made all this? And for a few moments, um, the dad says, yes, son, I do. And the boy just sits there for a minute and then says, wow. And to that, the dad responds, exactly. God's signature is the beauty of things. Amen.